This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Nebula is the home for my new original series, Great Cities. My most recent video in that series, which launches with this one, is all about the world's largest metro system in Shanghai. That video is longer and higher budget than this one. It also joins the other videos in the series on Paris's boulevards and Canberra, Australia. New videos in the Great Cities series drop every month. Sign up to Nebula for less than $1 per month so you don't miss any. Even the most die-hard car people will agree that taking a train to the airport is a better experience than braving airport traffic to either park in an expensive garage or try and navigate departures or arrivals to either drop off someone or pick them up. It's honestly one of the few places where just about everyone agrees that cars pose a fundamental geometry problem. Cars are simply too big. And when you get a large number of people descending on the departures level of an airport at 5 a.m., it creates a traffic jam every time. There's just not enough space. Taking the train, in contrast, means no traffic on the way, no parking hassles. And if you've arrived in a new city, a train can get you downtown without having to rent a car and trying to navigate roads you're unfamiliar with. Trains and airports just go together like trains and anything. Uh, trains are great, is what I'm saying. As a result, many cities globally have trains to their airports. It's seen as a symbol of a prosperous, business-oriented metropolis. It's business-oriented because business travelers in particular benefit from a train that takes them right from the airport to the downtown conference hotel or major downtown office buildings. Cities that want to court conventions and new businesses view airport rail as a winning proposition. In an era where mass transit is still recovering from COVID-19, and there are some real questions about if it will ever fully recover, rail to the airport seems like a bright spot in the transit landscape. It's a rare moment where you have train nerds, car commuters, city planners, and business people all agreeing that trains are the solution. The thing is, rail transport to airports is more complicated than it seems at first and may not even be a good idea, or at least the best idea. Planners have to consider factors like local versus express service, rail versus bus, serving visitors versus serving employees. Let's uncover the hidden complexities of rail transport to airports after the bike bell. Let's start this discussion of airport transit complexity by looking at an example. Denver International Airport is the second largest airport in the world by land area, and in 2019, the last normal travel year was the world's 16th busiest by passenger volume. It's a major domestic hub for United Airlines, Frontier Airlines, and Southwest Airlines. It also has flights to Europe, South America, and Asia. It's a massive, busy facility that employs 35,000 people. That makes it the largest employer in the U.S. state of Colorado. The airport opened in 1995, and in 2016, the transit operator RTD opened a commuter rail line connecting downtown Denver to the airport. It's a 37-minute trip between the airport and Denver Union Station, and the trip will set you back $10.50. It serves about 20,000 riders per day, making it the most popular line of the 12 total light and commuter rail lines serving the region. Now that we know the facts about the airport and the transit, we can discuss the pros and cons of the line. On the positive side, Denver International Airport employs tens of thousands of workers who could potentially use that rail line to get to work. And when you add in passengers that can also use that line, it makes a compelling case for connecting the airport via train. And airports can make great terminating stations too. In fact, in the streetcar suburb era, real estate developers would build attractions like amusement parks at the end of their streetcar lines to encourage ridership in the direction moving away from the central city. This is just a side note, but the Wikipedia entry on trolley parks is actually super interesting, and I've left the link in the description if you want to learn more. Airports are often terminating stations because they are so far from the central city. Denver's airport is particularly far. It feels like you're landing in the middle of nowhere. Those are some pros, but are there any cons? Well, yeah. 1050 one way doesn't sound that expensive if you're a traveler, particularly if you're comparing it to renting a car. But if you're someone who works at the airport, that's actually quite expensive. That's over $20 to get to and from work. Now, there are monthly passes for $200, and qualifying low-income individuals can cut their daily one-way fare to $6.30. But it's not exactly cheap. And you might be saying, well, it's cheaper than owning a car. And that would be the case, but I'm guessing that most airport employees have to take a car at some point in their trip anyway. That's in part because there are only six stops on the entire A line between the airport and downtown. Each of those stations has park and ride lots with 200 to 1,000 spaces. There isn't a whole lot else at some of these stations, meaning that someone who works at the airport is probably not living on the same rail line. If they aren't parking and riding, then they're probably transferring from another line, which is likely to make their commute closer to an hour each direction. That's not ideal. 
To be fair to Denver, the city has plans to transform these stations into transit-oriented development. It's one of the benefits of a line that goes into the middle of nowhere. There's a blank slate to build high-quality neighborhoods that support people walking to the station and taking the train. And that's already happened at the site of Denver's old airport, Stapleton, which is on the same A-line. After the new airport was built, the decommissioned airport became a new urbanist-style neighborhood development that currently houses 30,000 people in 12,000 housing units. This is the station for that area, and it seems like even those residents probably drive to the station. It's also somewhat unlikely that many airport employees live there, as it's one of the highest income neighborhoods in the Denver region, and most airport employees are low income. In fact, one study of airport transit affordability found that most Denver airport employees couldn't afford transit to work, and that was before the train when they were just taking a lower cost bus service. You might be wondering why I keep coming back to low income workers in a video about airport rail. The intended audience of that line is business travelers, right? Well, every transit line represents a choice about how to best spend limited transportation dollars. Denver is actually relatively well-funded thanks to a 2004 ballot measure that approved a sales tax for transit. It's generated billions of dollars for new lines. But even with all that money and new transit, one could make the argument that high-quality transit should be provided to those who need it most, which are often lower-income residents. Business travelers are the opposite. They are often higher income, and their travel may not even be paid for out of pocket. It wouldn't make a difference to the individual if their company reimbursed for transit fare or for a rental car. And the fares on the A-Line reflect this higher income target audience. What if the funds to build and operate the A-Line had been spent to upgrade bus service in central Denver, increasing coverage and frequency for people most likely either to not have a car or be willing to ditch theirs for high quality transit? RGD could still offer a bus to the airport like they did prior to 2016. This is the primary transit option for cities that don't have trains to the airport. When I lived in Sacramento, I took the bus to the airport all the time. It stopped downtown where I lived, made a couple more stops, and went express to the airport. It was a fantastic option. Now, the only possible downside is it could get stuck in traffic, but in places with HOV lanes, that's not a problem. Now, I was often taking the bus, you know, about five in the morning, like most people do to get to the airport, and there's never any traffic then anyway. But airport rail connections are popular with the general public, because for many people, it's one of the only scenarios where they would even consider transit at all. Many people will simply not consider riding a bus under any circumstances. Middle and upper income people with cars are considered choice riders, meaning they have other transportation options like driving a car. Lower income people and people without cars are considered captive riders, meaning they rely on transit and don't have any other options. They don't need to be convinced. Fast rail connections to the airport convince choice riders to hop on board but they don't necessarily make life better for captive riders. Choice riders can further be convinced by offering them express rail service to and from the airport. That means a train with far fewer stops than a normal rail line. O'Hare and Midway in Chicago are served by the regular CTA L lines, for example, but Pearson in Toronto and Heathrow in London have special express trains. Toronto only makes two stops in between Union Station and the airport, and the ride costs $12.35 one way. This is clearly a service aimed at travelers and not airport staff. It also suffers from the problem that not all travelers want to go downtown after the airport. But the train is reliable and fast, guaranteeing 25 minutes from downtown to the airport. So after hearing all of this discussion about airport transit, what's the best model? Well, the absolute best option is that the airport will be connected to a dense grid of rapid transit lines. And it would be easy for someone to transfer from the airport line to any other line in the system and access the entire metro area. The service doesn't have to be trains. Fast and convenient bus service can work fine. Trains offer the benefit of higher capacities, though, and are generally attractive for choice and captive riders. The ideal airport transit should also be affordable for airport staff. Free or reduced transit programs for airport staff could solve this problem. Or cities could see that the airport is just one of many destinations and not a special destination that requires a separate higher fare. Some cities can solve these airport transit issues by offering both express trains and local train services to the airport. Shanghai's Pudong International Airport is connected to the metro system and offers a one hour trip from downtown at normal metro fare. The airport is also connected to a higher cost maglev train that makes an eight minute trip to a major rail hub. Of course, Shanghai has the world's largest metro system, so this level of connectivity is basically a given. If you'd like to learn even more about this truly impressive metro system built in only 30 years, check out my Nebula original video on this topic. It's a part of my new series, Great Cities. 
I've already covered Paris's boulevards and the design of Australia's capital, Canberra. And New York's Central Park is coming up next. New episodes in the series drop every month, so go sign up now so you don't miss any. Great Cities joins my other great content you can't find anywhere else, like my video on planning ancient Rome, or 13 short bonus videos, or 20 videos with extended endings. On top of all of that, other great educational creators also post hours of additional content on Nebula. Creators like Real Life Lore and Wendover Productions. All of this content is ad-free, too. Signing up for Nebula is a great deal, and it's made even better thanks to our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the source for high-quality, engaging documentaries. You can learn more about Shanghai by watching the two-part CuriosityStream documentary, The Making of Shanghai, as well as many other documentaries featuring China. We have a deal where if you sign up to CuriosityStream using the link below or on screen, you get Nebula for free. That's not a free trial, but free as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And they're running an extra special deal, a holiday deal, where you can get the entire year for 42% off. That's less than $12 a year for CuriosityStream and Nebula. Seriously, that's less than a dollar a month. Signing up is a great way of supporting this channel, as well as the dozens of other creators working to make Nebula a success. And right now, it is a particularly great deal. So go click on the link on screen and get 42% off.